Hello, this is Willard Watson, Programs and Outreach Director at Brom. And today, I got to sit down and chat with Kim and Paul Fueling. They're a husband and wife team who work in fine woodworking and oil painting. They met at John Heron School of Art in Indianapolis, where they studied fine art. Then the couple moved to Boone, North Carolina in 1999 and settled in the Mabel area in 2004. They purchased a humble block building and renovated the industrial structure into a living area and studio space they call Mabel Studios. In 2010, Paul successfully established his own custom woodworking business, and then three years later, Kim began working and collaborating with Paul. Together, they construct a unique custom-built line of furniture, doors, and paintings with an acute attention to detail and craftsmanship. Their aesthetic can be described as rustic with a modern approach to material use and design. When asked about their work, they said, Integrity inspires the work we do with wood and paint. We work hard to create objects of lasting value. We set and maintain standards of our craft. We recognize our discipline's history and hope to add to its momentum. The first question I have today is, how did you begin woodworking? And was there any one person in particular who helped you get into it? I got a job working with Henry Vaughn, and uh, he is a master woodworker, and I apprenticed with him for 11 years, and owe a lot of what I know to that guy. Um, he was uh, really, really great, and uh, still good friends, and... He still works yeah, in Fosco. Yeah, he's, he's still building a lot of stuff, too. Yeah. Cool. Mm -hmm. And then Kim just. So mine kind of evolved after Paul had um, started his own wood shop in 2010. And I was still working full time and just kind of still painting, but not as much. And then eventually I was able to join full time and paint a lot more. But then eventually I realized I wanted to paint on wood. And um, he started making panels for me. And then I realized I could carve into those. And then it evolved into some more sculptural stuff and so on. So just having a really nice wood shop got me into it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and of course, it's a beautiful medium. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, in particular, I love how you incorporate the natural grains of the wood in your paintings and to some of your night <laughs> scenes that I've uh, seen just are just mesmerizing the way that you kind of stain the wood and have that uh, be the night sky. Now, um, Paul, I think you said you have a fine arts background. Did you go to school for art? Yeah, we uh, both went to John Heron School of Art in Indianapolis. That's where we met, mm -hmm. uh, both with a uh, major in uh, painting. Um, and I wasn't actually doing any kind of woodworking. I was doing kind of installation I went from painting to more like installation art and uh, but I mean the woodworking was kind of an eye-opener because I like the fact that the pieces have to have some sort of function you know so it gave me like a focus and you know when I was working with Henry you know we did everything from you know fine woodworking tables and stuff to cat kitchen cabinet we kind of did everything and since I opened my own shop I just focused more on you know trying to bring my art into, you know, the woodworking. And, you know, so I, so I tried to, you know, um, get away from just like doing no work and, you know, moldings and stair treads and stuff like that and try to do more stuff that I was interested in. And I'm still, you know, trying to do that, trying to push like ideas that I have into my, into my woodworking. Awesome. And I've heard that a uh, similar sentiment echoed in other uh, artists that having the kind of the constriction of making something that's functional actually allows their creativity to flourish. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of just having just no boundaries makes it very difficult for them. Yeah. If you want to be productive in art, um, having the piece have to function properly and having a deadline of when it's got to be done. <laughs> and a client that's waiting for it, nothing will motivate you more <laughs> than that. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, do you all teach woodworking at all or is education a part of your process at all? No, I mean, we get a lot of uh, 
you know, we get a lot of people that want to apprentice and want to, you know, and want to do that. But right now we're just so slammed trying to get our product, you know, a product out. But I do, you know, in the future have considered, you know, like maybe when I want to slow down a little bit, that I might do something like that, you know, like teach classes, you know, because I definitely get a lot of, you know, inquiries about that. Mm -hmm. But right now it's just hustling every day to get, you know, get the jobs done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a good problem to have. <laughs> yeah. It is. yeah. Um, Okay, so North Carolina has a rich history of furniture making, and was this a factor in your decision to work in the state? And has your time in North Carolina shaped your work at all? Um, I mean, it's definitely shaped my work. Um, the fact that it was a furniture capital, you know, that didn't didn't really have a didn't really play into our decision. We came here to you know because it's a beautiful place, and we wanted to rock climb, and you know we wanted to, we just wanted to live here. Um, you know, it, it was actually later when I found out about, you know, all the furniture factories and it has helped finding, you know, machinery and stuff like that because it is more available here. Um, but yeah, it didn't, it, it wasn't really on my radar until after I had been woodworking for quite a while. Um, but, you know, yeah, definitely living here, especially in her work, you know, um, has influenced her work greatly because she does a lot of you know, landscapes. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing too is just the market here in North Carolina is conducive to what we do. And that's, that's a blessing, you know, that's, that yeah. helps us tremendously. So, cause we're from the Midwest, we're from Indiana and I don't think we could quite pull off the same stuff yeah. we're doing here. No, I, I have a friend in, I have a friend in Indiana who's a woodworker and he does incredible work but it's always white painted like you know really you know like a certain style that he has to pull off every time traditional he, yeah traditional say, and here yeah. with like the mountain look and you know it gives me a little bit more freedom to you know yeah people are more willing yeah. to push their create creative yeah. side in their interiors yeah you know trying to do outdo their neighbors and just yeah. do fun stuff you know yeah. so it's been good mm -hmm. when do you choose to follow traditions and when do you choose to experiment and have you like found a way to make some traditional processes your own oh, oh definitely i'd say i mean you know again like with you know like the restrictions of certain pieces of furniture they have to function a certain way and you know, they, there's a reason that, you know, the Shakers built things the way they did. There's a reason George Nakashima built things the way he did. And, you know, a lot of those things you have to stick with because there's a function to them and there's a reason why they're done. Um, you know, more recently, you know. Especially the engineering. Like yeah, you know, engineering, hardware, you know, um, mechanics and stuff. More recently, I've definitely been able to push more like, you know, um, ideas that I, that I see in other aspects of art, you know, like even painting and, you know, sculpture, um, you know, I try to bring those into, you know, like say a functioning table or something like that. Um, so I've definitely been trying to push more, you know, like ideas that I have in art, you know. I think another thing we've realized in design is people like something pretty familiar, like the shape or the silhouette needs to be pretty familiar with what they're used to, but then you can push maybe just one aspect. And that's really all you need to come up with something really beautiful and something different. I think it took me a long time to realize you weren't trying to go way outside of the realm and come up with something completely new and different. You really just need to work with what's been done in the past and just push little elements yeah i mean a lot of a lot of my pieces are basically where i take you know something like say a shaker piece i think the piece that's in the museum right now is based on a shaker piece and you know just try to modernize it maybe put some ideas that i have into it but you know as far as the construction and you know 
the functionality of it it's totally based on traditional woodworking you know um there are certain aspects of traditional woodworking that i you know don't like and steer away from but you know there's some that you know i think are ignored a lot like you know the expansion and contraction of wood and how things move over time that you've got to pay attention to or you have pieces that fail you know 10 years down the road you know so yeah so i uh, kind of going off that onto the pieces that you have in the exhibit um i remember when you dropped off the shaker bench that you said that uh it's inspired by the form but that you use some really dramatic wood grain and that that wood grain was a little too flashy for the shakers. Yeah, they probably would have steered away from using like, you know, it was like a curly kind of a bird's eye um, curly maple. And they, you know, they definitely would have steered away from that. They didn't want anything to, you know, have any kind of like pizzazz to it. You know, they, they wanted everything to be Very real strict, you know, austere. austere and they didn't want it to compete with yeah. the Lord's yeah. creative side. Yeah, natural, you know, they, but you know, you know, we definitely, yeah, you know, I, I, I often pick, you know, a piece to build specifically on like wood that I have and you know, that wood, it just lined itself up perfectly, you know, with that piece, even though, you know, they might, they might not have done something like that. And I also, you know, kind of modernized the legs, but we also used, you know, traditional, you know, they, they used like three different colors and, you know, we, we wanted to like, you know, have odes to that. We used the same colors that they would use and the same. Um, we took their, um, they all, they often had um, like pegboards that went along the wall to hang chairs and well, they didn't, Mirrors chairs and brooms yeah, yeah sometimes mirrors on and you know instead of just having that on the wall behind it we tied it into the piece um you know so it's like an it's kind of an homage to them but you know something that they necessarily wouldn't they do, wouldn't have done you know? that yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah and that that is a really nice uh piece that you added to it with the pegboard on it just that nice right angle it kind of coming fun. off it yeah. it does make it fun in that nice blue milk paint type that you use is really pretty um and then your so like the exact opposite was uh another piece that you had in there the ode to george nakashima the bench and so that was a piece of ebonized cherry and it really was just so dramatic because it's this beautiful cut of wood that has so much character but it looks like it was always in that shape you know, I, I just couldn't see the seam or anything where you kind of, few, you know, cut the board and molded it together to, um, so could you talk about how you made that? Well, that one, um, that was, I mean, and that's what that was all about was I had that, that big slab of wood. It was a really odd shape. I was it. leaning up against the wall at the shop yeah. for like two years and we'd yeah, keep staring and at just, it. Just could not figure out what to do with it. I'm not like a real big fan of cherry and, you know, just like a clear cherry. I don't, um, you know, so it was just really hard for me to find something that, you know, like, what am I going to do with that board? What am I going to do with that board? And, and then all of a sudden I realized two things, one to ebonize it black, which then all of a sudden I really liked the, you know, the cherry. I didn't, you know, I generally don't like how it turns real red and real pink, you know, but once I ebonized it, um, that was, you know, inspired me. And then finally realizing that, you know, hardly any cuts need to be made to it at all. You know, once I, once I realized, you know, it, oh, the bench was the perfect thing for it. And, you know, you know, and that, that was the kind of trick to like how to get it in the right proportion, the right, everything with, without doing anything to it, you know, just the minimal amount of, of cuts to make it you know, into what it is. Um, and even leaving the flaws, like that edge kind of like gets yeah. to where it's not perfect anymore. There's some dips in it and so on. And leaving mm -hmm. that and letting it show off, I think stuff like that makes a big difference. Yeah, and that's hard to do. Um, but we try to do that as, you know, I really, and I really like that in, in the pieces I've seen. I always would see, you know, famous woodworkers, uh, pieces like in magazines or in books, you know, and I'd always just think they were so perfect. And then, you know, I'd see some in 
you know, a museum or up close in, in real life and, and see like, you know, you know, flaws and, you know, mm -hmm. distressing and, you know, it's nice. Yeah. And yeah, I really started being attracted to that. So, you know, yeah, it's kind of a challenge. You like don't want to leave you know, a doty rotty piece of wood on He's there. He's a perfectionist too, as far as like, he likes <laughs> everything to be squared up and perfect as much as possible. So, yeah, it's, so it's a big challenge been, for me to, <laughs> to, to do that. But when I do it, you know, sometimes successfully, um, you know, I definitely get a, a sense of pride of pulling that off, you know, because I've definitely done it where I've not been happy with it, you know. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that piece uh, really just, it was it was a challenge because, like I said, it I just could not figure out what to do with it. And then when I did finally figure it out, I was just like, oh, my God, this thing is, it's, it's like being, it's, it's obvious, it seems obvious. And that's what you want is... When you when you finish it, it just seems like it's been that its whole life, you know. Mm -hmm. And then the um, the joinery that you used for there uh, for that did was it dovetails or something? Uh, did you use any nails or anything? It just uh, no, no. I mean, uh, there. Yeah, it's all um, like a floating tenon in the miter. Um, and I think the um, there's one leg on it, or two two legs on it, and those are one, just one. Yeah, and um, those are just um, um, just bolted to the bottom. Um, I wanted to be able to make them removable in case it was a tight squeeze getting it into a house, and you know. But the spindles are all but the, more yeah the, the, yeah. There's no uh, screws or, or or nails in any of that you know, that spindle back or anything like that. That's all, that's all um, put together with, um, you know, like a shouldered tenon. Um, and most of the joinery I use is, I mean, that was really complicated, really um, um, difficult to do um, Japanese joinery. And I do use some of that, but I usually use the most basic ones. You know, they, I find that they, they work and I don't need to complicate you know, I don't need to complicate it with some kind of really elaborate joint. Um, so, you know, we, we try to make sure everything is just built to uh, simple, 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 design. simple yeah. and, and made to strong and made to last, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the, just very clean lines, very uh, clean design and that shows through in your work. And then with the buffet that's in there as well with the hand hewn uh, wood, front you know it's just very nice how the contrast with the very clean modern design of the cabinet but then the doors have just this writ this character and that aged look with the wood it's a nice contrast and the same thing with uh your sculptures kim that are there the the tools you know it adds this the light painting that you have on it and just the fact that so were those all hand carved or yeah i mean i use all sorts of tools, but I also have a little um, handheld like chainsaw and it is cool as can be. So a lot of it's done with that. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, they're all, I use a million tools to get those done mm -hmm. and slowly mm -hmm. work on them, chip away at them, but yeah. Mm -hmm. I think there's something really cool about, you know, a, a sculptor making tools because it's kind of an homage to the thing that makes, allows them to do what they do, you know, it's like the tools yeah. of your craft. And, um, and so many people relate to it. Mm -hmm. I, I think I was really looking for that, something we can all just like, yeah, mm -hmm. we all use tools. Everybody's kind of attracted to them. So yeah. mm -hmm. again, that, that, you know, those tools could be, you know, carved more and more and more until they're just like photorealistic, you know, perfect. And we just find that's, it's not, you know, what we're trying to do. We want to show, you know, the, the, the machine marks, the hack marks, you know, chisel marks, um, you know, it's just. They, I'm trying to make them look painterly, even mm -hmm. though they're a sculpture. So yeah, yeah. It's... You know, I see the brush marks, essentially. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they do have a lot of texture to them mm -hmm. and a, a lot of depth, even though they're just one color um, in that, those shapes. Uh, so the next question is, what's historically associated with men and um, in other forms of art, we've noticed that there are issues of diversity, for example, gender and race. 
um, are a recurring topic in, among different mediums. Um, so do you see similar issues facing wood artists? I mean, in, in, nowadays, I don't see why that would be an issue. You know, to me, it's, I mean, we've moved so far past that, you know, that now, like, I wouldn't see, you know, to, there are female woodworkers that are just as capable and, mm -hmm. and, you know, if not better than, you know, they bring a different, you know. Um, they probably bring a different way of uh, putting things together. Yeah, well, it just, uh, yeah, I mean, nowadays, mm -hmm. you know, like, I mean, I hope that, you know, women and people of color have the opportunity to do, you know, things like, you know, woodworking and art, because, I mean, I know. at this we, point, it, you know, it just seems. It comes so comes in so handy in just regular life, too. I mean, yeah. it's not like we all have to be these great woodworkers, but it's just knowing some of those basic skills. Yeah. and Just, you know, yeah, to like start with, and finish a project. I mean. Yeah. Being able to start and finish a project. Yeah, I mean. <laughs> every part every, every time. time. Yeah. yeah, something that like everybody can benefit from. Um, I wouldn't, I don't see any reason. You know, yeah. Yeah. I wish they could teach yeah. it more in schools. Yeah, I mean, exactly. Like mm -hmm. the fact that they're taking art programs and woodworking and metal shop and stuff out of schools to me is just a tragedy, you know? Yeah, yeah. when you really develop a lot of problem solving and uh, skills and discipline through practices of art or woodworking or metalwork, it is a shame when those are like real vocational skills and those are being yeah. removed and defunded. And yeah, it seems um, through conversations I've had, it's really kind of an question of access like accessibility to the tools and to an education around woodworking uh, yeah. just I mean in older generations you know they grew up with a wood shop in their school mm -hmm. um, now kids don't have that or depending on where you live if you're from the inner city you might not have wood shop at your school but if you're from a more rural place you might have a wood shop uh, and it is good hearing about there's so many women in high places within the woodworking field and the furniture design field, it seems that um, that is a trend that is on the way up, you know? So it's nice that with wood, you know, a, a medium that appreciates the natural diversity of your materials so mm -hmm. much uh, that, you know, also appreciating diversity of the artists, you know, seems to be something that is uh, a priority. Um, so is, nature a topic in your work either through subject matter or material and do you ever use found materials oh yes yeah yeah i'm always uh i mean we when we go and um, paddle lakes and rivers i'm always looking at the the uh, driftwood, driftwood yeah. and you know getting inspired by it and maybe trying to pull a piece out of the woods to a lot of times i'll do like a credenza with just a branch you know as the stretcher and you know, um, we have a um, antique like, hardware too. We're yeah. always on the look for that. Yeah, yeah. It, we definitely use a lot of found object. Uh, I used to use do it more often. Um, just haven't had the opportunity lately, really, with anything we're doing. But, but yeah, definitely. If, if you look back at some of my older pieces, you see a lot of like, you know, and that's again like ties into where we we want to show like the imperfections like the natural decay of something you know so when those pieces that have been like just weathered out there and by the sun on a beach you know it's all it's just like oh there it is it's perfect you know it, you know same with like the ant holes running through a slab or mm -hmm. the wormholes it's almost like yeah. you clean them out but then you show them off yeah you want to highlight them instead of cutting them off or you mm -hmm. know so I think nature definitely plays a big role. We also don't like to stain. We've ebonized wood, which so, um, you know, that's different, but we try not to use too many stains. So it's yeah. not like you're trying to make this piece of pine look like cherry or, yeah. you know, which are, try to stay away from that stuff and just let the natural grain show itself off mm -hmm. um, and use clear finishes. Yeah. But yeah. Mm -hmm. and even in finishes, we are going, We've kind Minimal. of um, we've kind of moved away from any you know we're going towards more of a natural finish oils and waxes, 
opposed to like poly, you know, yeah. polycrylics and stuff like that, you know. Um, Low VOCs, yeah. more matte looking finish. It doesn't, yeah. you know, it's not like a gloss yeah. sheet. Really trying to get away from anything, having like that layer of like, yeah, high gloss over it, you know. One thing in the trend is moving away from that and, you know, the, to us, it just lets the piece, you know, you're actually showing the wood off and not some high gloss, you know, thick finish that's on it. Um, mm -hmm. And then in her work, you know, just a lot of I mean, times she's no using, finish. yeah, she's using, land, you know, she's doing, you know, landscapes and, um, you know, like taking her imagery right out of nature, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's interesting. Kim, you said you, you try to not use stuff with VOCs. I mean, it's one thing. I mean, the, the chemicals that are used on a lot of woodworking are just so toxic. So um, it's yeah. rough for it's you as makers. And then it's also the your clients, you know, you're putting that and it's going to off gas in their home for a little while. And yeah, and it's yeah. taken like until recently to get products that mm -hmm. are actually usable, that mm -hmm. look good and are performing well. I mean, it's yeah, it's we, been a long time. Yeah, we I probably sprayed lacquer for 12 years and one day decided that I'm never going to do that again. <laughs> you know, it's I'm just, pretty sure it was giving me nerve damage. Gnarly, <laughs> you know, yeah. so yeah, we've we found some stuff that we really We're trying. Like. It's still a challenge, mm -hmm. you know, some projects just call for certain things you have to do, but mm -hmm. we try for sure. Mhm. Mm um so do you have a favorite wood to work with? Um right now I like to me, white oak is, it's available here. It's local. It's, I call, uh, yeah, I call it America's exotic. Um, tons of character to it. Lo I just, yeah, right now I am kind of on a kick that I could build everything out of white oak and, mm -hmm. you know, like the quarter song white oak, the riff song white oak, and then the big slabs of white oak. Um, right now I'm just kind of hooked on it and want to build everything out of it. I used to feel that way with walnut. Walnut to get wide and big pieces of walnut, it's getting harder to har harder harder and harder to come by. And uh, you know, I just the the pieces I've been doing lately, I'm just like, why haven't I just been using this the whole time? I just, <laughs> you know, it just it's got everything that I want in it, you know. And as and that's one of the things that. Um, I'm pretty adamant about is I have no desire to bring in some Brazilian rainforest wood. I know a, a lot of woodworkers, they almost take pride in the fact that it's got like some, you know, zebra skin, this, or, you know, some purple heart that, you know, and I just don't really, I don't, I don't, I don't get it, you know, like, so you had that shipped over from some rainforest, you know, was that an orangutan's house? I don't know. <laughs> But I'm not interested in, and you know, I like the fact that we're yeah. getting, and even even to take that a little bit farther, we're trying to actually source most of our wood from trees that, you know, came down in a storm or you know had to be cut because they were dangerous. You know. Yeah, we've got you know. some good suppliers now. Yeah, and if it is milled, you know, like lumber from lumber yards, we try to you know make sure that it's wood that's, um, you know, farmed for lumber, you know, and not old growth forest is you know it's being cut we had a client a couple years ago they did a new house up on top of beach, it's a beach yeah. wasn't it? yeah. and so it was above the elevation line where the yellow birch start growing and they're all gnarly and small and um they cleared the land and actually took the time to have all those slabbed up and then they and had them kiln dried and then were given to us to build their furniture out of. And that was really cool. I mean, it's a lot of extra expense for them, but it but, is special yeah. to have that woodworking inside the house. Yeah, it, it turned cool, out so. that the dining room table was built out of the wood off that land and actually sat in the exact same spot that that tree grew in, <laughs> you know? Wow. Just, it's you know, stuff cool. like that to us is, you know, it, and they it's appreciated special. it, yeah. which, um, you know, is, it's good to find, you know, people that, you know, get what we're trying to do and get, get that kind of thing, you know, mm -hmm. if you're going to take down a tree to build your house. Why not use that tree in your house? You know? Yeah, that's really cool. And it's kind of like neo-traditional in some ways because the first people that came here, so they do, they come, they clear a homestead and they yeah. build the trees on site and build their house from that, build their furniture from those. Yeah. Logs. Very cool. yeah. yeah. We just, 
we just got two of the trees that were out in front of the old Code Creek Historic School. You know, had been growing out there they for had to cut 100 them. years or so. Um, and they, yeah, they finally got, they did everything they could to save them, but finally it got to where they were kind of getting dangerous. And um, so we just had those taken to a sawyer and I'm, and it'll probably be a year before I get them back, but I am excited about that. Cause again, you know, like I'll be able to build furniture knowing that those trees were sitting right out in front of my shop. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's really special. And it's really cool that, yeah, your shop is located um, at, attached to a historic school building um, in Sugar Grove, North Carolina. And that, that your shop was the wood shop for that school at one point too. So it's really cool how you're, you know, you're, using you're in this kind of older traditional place you know and you're using these traditional techniques and kind of continuing that tradition and bringing it forward you know mm -hmm. it's been, yeah it's, just, it's the same thing like you know we've always taken note and kind of been inspired by you know uh, about you know taking something that's pre-existing our house is an old wood carving shop that you know that we transformed into our home and you know, everybody just kind of wants to put up a cheap metal building to get the job done. And, you know, I understand sometimes that's the only option, but, you know, there's so many opportunities to take some dilapidated old, dilapidated old mm -hmm. barn, or, you know, building, you know, and, and that foundation's fine, you know, that concrete floor is fine, you know, yeah, it's going to take a lot of work, but, you know, it's, It'd be worth it. yeah, it's, it, you, know, it's, I, you know, just, you know, like in European cities where, there's a 500 year old building and, and it needs restored. Well, instead of just tearing it down, putting up a metal building, they will save the facade, save the exterior stonework, you know. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it just seems like, you know, to me, like the obvious way. I wish we could do more of that. Yeah, I wish yeah. we could do more of that, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for uh, taking your time out of your morning today to talk with me. This has been a wonderful conversation. and.